ओम ज्ञान श्रीरंधस्य ज्ञानंजन शलाखय This morning I'll speak some uh, thoughts and reflections on this project here. Everyone is welcome to turn their cell phone off. And yeah, this you're here to fulfill Prabhupada's dream and one of my dreams is to live in a place where there are no cell phones so maybe maybe that's uh, in future though or maybe even now people think that the definition of heaven no cell phones <laughs> Yeah, Prabhupada had this dream. Uh, Srila Prabhupada, so many words of praise have been, have been said about him um, in various ways he's appreciated. One of the facets of Srila Prabhupada's transcendental personality is that he's a very practical person. Uh, and he saw that city life is sapping the spiritual inclinations of people. And materially and spiritually, people become uh, more and, and more uh, degraded by city life. So Srila Prabhupada very practically wanted to establish these projects to fulfill uh, various purposes. I didn't say Varnashram. You said Varnashram. <laughs> You're going ahead. I said village projects. So, uh, he, he said the main purpose is to, is to save time for practicing spiritual life. Um, one, uh, one point is that people often criticize devotees that they're simply parasites, nothing useful to do, wasting time. But this, these kind of projects, they're very practical. That we're not parasites, we're not living off other people's endeavors. Like Actually, if we see the most of society, most most people are, in modern society, increasingly most people are not producing anything. They're not producing anything useful. They're not doing. I, I mean, writing and producing magazines, talking about the romances of film stars. That's not useful for anyone. For instance. <coughs> Sports, it's not useful for anyone. It serves no practical purpose for anyone. But somehow or other, they, materialistic people think sports and sleazy magazines are something useful for society. And chanting Hare Krishna isn't. So, uh, apart from chanting Hare Krishna, it's something practical. Producing food is the most practical uh, contribution to human society. As Lord Krishna very practically says in Bhagavad Gita, Anad Bhavanti Bhutani. Everyone, every living being lives on food. When Srila Prabhupada came to Hyderabad, I believe it was in 1974, when he arrived at the airport, a journalist asked Srila Prabhupada, Are you a Dvaitavadi or an Advaitavadi? Srila Prabhupada didn't even answer. It. He said, What's the use of this question? There's been no rain here for two years. <laughs> And then he quoted, Anad Bhavanti Bhutani. Everyone needs food, and food comes from rain. So Prabhupada said, There's no yagya. There's no, this is Bhagavad Gita. Anad Bhavanti Bhutani, Parjanya Adana Sambhavaha. Yagya Bhavati Parjanyo, Yagya Karma Samudbhavaha. Rain comes from yagya, and yagya is, uh, is, comes from people performing their proper duties. So Prabhupada said, We're going to perform yagya here, Sankirtan yagya. And actually, within two days of Prabhupada's arriving, 
rain came for the first time in two years. So, uh, very practical. Uh, producing food. Whatever schemes we may have, socialism, communism, fascism, nationalism, so many isms, but it's all starvationism unless there's some food is the, is the basic requirement. So by establishing these projects, uh, devotees are doing something very practical, uh, not simply otherworldly. People accuse us of being otherworldly. We're not concerned with this world. We're just off in some imaginary spiritual world. But this is very practical, producing food. Uh, and actually, the, the, the world situation is increasingly going toward one of food shortage. At the present time, it's, being, uh, it's coming in the news. And there are riots in different countries because there's a lack of food. And here in India... Um, they had the Green Revolution, which they're now finding with the, the ultimate result is it's a disaster. It's, it's typical of the mode of passion. It looks good for a short time. Then in the long run, it's, uh, it has a very bad effect. So now they want to go for the second Green Revolution, following the Western pattern of what they call corporate farming and having me mega farms. But that in the West is also a disaster. It, again, for a short time it looks good, but it completely spoils the land and turns fertile land into deserts, literally. Literally. Uh, for instance, much of Colorado State in America was fertile land, and now it's completely useless. And it used to be... Uh, the Colorado River is dead, a dead river. It's, it's dried up completely. So Their programs are all disastrous. So... Srila Prabhupada wanted to show how by uh, following tr the traditional way of life, not trying to uh, do better than God, not trying to organize the world better than God himself organized it, people can live uh, very happily. Uh, but of course, the, the main point is not to live happily in this world. It's simple living and high thinking. Of the two things, the high thinking part is the most important. Of course, simple living is, is not just simple living. That in itself is a blessing to be able to live simply. Although in the modern age, um, people find it difficult. They, they, they come, even though it's so nice. I mean, here you can, you, here we can breathe the air without getting poisoned. Which most people in the world, they, every breath they're taking in poison. What a horrible society. Just by breathing, you get poisoned. By eating, you get poisoned. By drinking water, you get poisoned. If you, if you buy the water, you won't be poisoned as much. The plastic, maybe. The plastic bottle poisons you somewhat, but maybe not, maybe not as much as the uh, water which you get from the tap. In fact, at one point in some states in America, it was illegal to drink the tap water because it was so dangerous to drink. And in London, I heard that the tap water is recycled through the sewage system like 15 times. So it's been, you know, it's been mixed up with stool 15 times and then you drink it. It's not very uh, inspiring to drink the water. <laughs> so, uh, just to have fresh air, fresh food, uh, fresh mind, that in itself is a blessing. And most people, they, they feel uneasy when they come to a place like this. There's not enough noise. It's, what do you do? I, I heard that in uh, America, people, they go on holiday from a city like New York. They can... They used to be able to buy some recording of city sounds, like sirens. <laughs> in New York, in London also, you'll hear all night the, the, the police sirens going off and people screaming and, and cars honking because they can't sleep without that. Without that noise, they can't sleep. They, they feel uneasy because it's too, it's too peaceful. <laughs> 
But actually, if one spends some time and lets, lets one's vibrations slow down from the mode of passion, and then one becomes used to that way of life, it's, uh, it's much better in all respects for the human being. It is, uh, it's uh, the way that humans are supposed to live. Whether you take Darwin's theory or Krishna's theory, humans are meant to live like this, <coughs> not in cities. So it's uh, simple living, uh, high thinking, and of course uh, a major component of the uh, village projects is go seva, go raksha, protecting the cows, serving the cows, uh, which is also... Uh, very pleasing. There's no actual Brahminical culture, which means there's no high thinking <coughs> without protecting the cows. Last week in Hyderabad, one man came to see me. Very big body, but weeping. He was literally crying. He told me he's uh, he's from the Yadav community, which they are said to be descended from Krishna's family. They're all over India, you'll find Yadavs. Maybe not in Bengal, but in North India, South India. And they, traditionally, they keep cows here in South India. So he was weeping because he, he had become inspired to look after cows and protect them from the slaughterhouse. He was an advocate, so he, but he said, it's, in, it's impossible. I, I, what can I do? I mean, you, 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 you catch the cows have been so badly treated that uh, they're, they're, they're just to see them is so sad. And then I, I, I can't by yourself. You can't look after so many sick cows and where's the money for it? And he wanted to. He very much wanted to protect cows and save them from the slaughterhouse. But he found that single-handedly he was unable to do so. So we can't stop cow slaughter by saving, trying to catch cows which are illegally being taken to the slaughterhouse. Um, we, we, we don't have the capacity to do that, but we can, at least in a small way, demonstrate how people can live very happily and peacefully with the cows. And uh, the cows are very useful and economically productive. That wealth in traditional society, is wealth. wealth is measured by gabayo dhanava. Dhanyavan, uh, dhanava. Yeah, one who has uh, cows and rice paddy, they are considered wealthy. <coughs> cows means, of course, also bulls. We have to train the bulls to work. If we don't train the bulls, we'll think they're a burden. We have to look after them and feed them. We don't get anything from them. And then we want to slaughter them. That's, that's what comes if we do. The bulls have to work. So that's very important also, training the bulls. Uh, and although it's a peaceful way of life, it's not a retirement home where people just come and do nothing. People are busy, but not busy, but in a different mode to the city where everyone's always in anxiety and working harder and getting money. And, but everyone has work to do. Uh, even in old age, people may remain busy. The, the, you've seen the cover of that book, the glimpses of traditional Indian life. There's a there's a photo of an of an old brahmana offering puja. So at the time that photo was taken, he was over a hundred years old. This brahmana from Udupi, and uh, he would daily get up early in the morning, go out in the fields, milk the cows, do puja. <coughs> he just went on with that. He was over a hundred years old. I, I was surprised to know he was a hundred years old. I mean, he's obviously old, but he didn't look that old. But he was just going on like that. So, um, retirement means in retirement we become more busy, like Prabhupada. He retired and preached Krishna consciousness. And so, as far as much as people are capable, they should go on working. Of course, if they're bedridden, then you can't do uh, much about it, but 
part of, when we talk of simple living and high thinking, part of high thinking is not just sitting around thinking, but you just sit and think. But uh, from high thinking should come noble action. Thinking, feeling, willing. One should have some activities for the benefit of human society. It's uh, one you can't claim, well, I'm just a brahmana, so people should look after me. That's what some brahmanas think nowadays, that I'm entitled just to do nothing or as little as possible, and then people should just give me money. But they should, they should act for the benefit of others. By, well, they themselves do patan, they study shastra, but for patan, for teaching others. They personally worship deities, yajan, but they also perform yajan for the benefit of others. They perform pujas and all these things also. So, uh, high thinking, simple living. Um, this simple living, high thinking, by the way, that uh, could be taken as a paraphrase of the well-known terms vairagya vidya, simple living, vairagya, and vidya, high thinking, which are basic to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings, vairagya vidya nija bhakti yogam shikshartha vekam purusha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Sharir Adhari Kripambhuti Yastamaham Kapadya The famous uh, verse in praise of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that he is the original personality of Godhead himself who is teaching Bhakti Yoga, devotional service to himself which is based on Vairagya Vidya Vairagya means detachment and vidya means knowledge. Otherwise, uh, if we try to think in a high manner or an intellectual manner, but without detachment and renunciation, then we may, there may be so much philosophy, but it will degrade. And therefore we find modern Western psychology, philosophy, it's all uh, extremely, the, the actual outcome of it all is extreme degradation. Extreme. And in the name of philosophy and human rights, they justify the most degraded behavior. And they can't even understand. It doesn't even cross their mind. They don't, in other words, they don't even think about it. That for all their big educational institutes and talking so many things and so many high, inter apparently intellectual subjects, they're killing literally millions of animals every day. What kind of society is that? It's totally uh, degraded and barbaric. So for all their high thinking or their educational institutions, it's not really high thinking at all. It's... it's uh, Modern philosophy, psychology, it's all aimed simply at sense gratification. So, uh, one point that, we, yeah, there's, there's simple living. We, uh, we also want, it's not just simple living, and not just simple living and chanting Hare Krishna, but high thinking should be there also. That means that, uh, we're here to serve the cows, work on the land, serve the Vaishnavas, um, chant Hare Krishna, but also there should be discussion of philosophy. It's not. Philosophy or philosophical understanding of Krishna consciousness is not only for a few people. It's meant for everyone. Every Vaishnava is, it may not be a bhakti shastri or whatever, but uh, actually the teachings and the philosophy they're they're given in Ramayana. Uh, Ramayana is considered that it's uh, equal to the Vedas, Valmiki Ramayana. So everyone can inculcate 
uh, sorry, everyone can imbibe uh, the, uh, the, t- the teachings of Shastra by hearing them. They can understand the basic teachings. Not everyone may be so uh, expert or deeply learned to understand the subtle difference between Kevaladvaita Vad and Vishishtadvaita Vad and all this kind of thing. But that may not be necessary also for everyone. The basic principles everyone should understand. We are servants of Krishna. We are meant to surrender to Krishna. We're eternal living beings. We don't belong in this world of birth and death. Everyone should know that. So high thinking also, uh, in the sense that some people at least should be uh, learned in all this bhakti shastra. Traditionally, the uh, in the now in, now in the villages we find it's mostly uh, there are a few landowners and some very poor landless laborers. That's mostly the population of the villages in India today. But previously there were many, uh, up until less than a hundred years ago, before the urbanization, there were many very learned brahmanas living in the villages. They'd also have some land or they'd be, they'd be worshipping in the temples and uh, they'd have the temple land, they would be... Uh, they would live off the temple land like that and they'd be very highly learned and, but then they all went off to the cities to get modern education and that's it and that's, that was the end of the high culture in the villages but uh, it's not that there's the idea that anyone who lives in the village is just stupid or uneducated yes. but uh, traditionally the high culture was there Everywhere, not in the in the city and the village. The city didn't mean this horrible, polluted, uh, congested megapolises. But the city, even just like Prabhupada said, Mayapur, he said, shouldn't be more than fifty thousand. For that, shouldn't make more of a population than that. That's big enough. So not too big. So uh, this. High thinking it should be uh, vidya has to be accompanied by vairagya. Unless the two things are there, then uh, that will degrade. In the name of vidya, just like we see, even we may be surprised that even uh, taking Prabhupada's books, people are, in the name of Prabhupada they say so many strange things. We're finding. Nowadays, but we shouldn't be surprised because that happens with every uh, teacher. Uh, every uh, that people come and take their teachings and change it into sense gratification. That's there with Jesus, with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, with the original Vedas, and it's just what the conditioned souls do. They they. they distort the teachings according to their own understanding. So, there are so many, uh, just just like we see some, there are some courses offered in within the ISKCON society, which are supposed to be Bhakti Shastra courses, but some of the modules are directly taken from Karmi University courses. And just people who believe in f- Freud and Darwin and Marx and they're just complete nonsense and, and demoniac actually. But somehow or other they, they somehow or other they think that's compatible with Prabhupada's teachings. It's, what can I say? Maya is very strong. But uh, that's going to come about if we don't have a sense of detachment from this world. That's uh, a very strong current in traditional uh, Indian thought. And I, when I say Indian thought, I'm not talking about just the uh, the big philosophers, but the people in general. The, the, the idea, which in the Western world is called fatalistic, or that, well, everyone knows that this is idea, well, we're all going to die and... Uh, Material life is miserable. We have to get out of this material world. 
when every that should be a, a point that everyone is prominent in everyone's consciousness because without knowing this and understanding this uh, then we're going to think this world is a nice place for me to enjoy. And then we're in trouble. <coughs> that is the whole trouble that we're in. That we're thinking this material world is a nice place for us to enjoy. But when we understand that we're just here for a very short time. We, in this human life we have to do whatever is required to get out of this world. So unless that understanding is prominent, we can discuss... Krishna's pastimes and chant Hare Krishna but unless there's this uh, serious urge to become free from material existence then we'll compromise Krishna consciousness with worldly enjoyment and then to do that you have to pervert the philosophy and come up with all kinds of strange ideas and what is normal that after any great teacher is that what they people will find some exception that he made at one time to some rule and take that as the rule. Just like, for instance, if Prabhupada once allowed someone, for instance, not to chant 16 rounds, then they'll say, see? And then that becomes the rule for everyone. Ignoring all the literally dozens of injunctions that Prabhupada repeatedly says we have to chant 16 rounds. So this kind of cheating mentality. We should avoid this cheating mentality. Now this Bhakti Shastra course is going on. should be very clearly uh, on the principle of Anyabhila Shita Shunyam Jnana Kama Jnana Vritam Anukunyena Krishna Nushilanam Bhakti Rutama that com- the, the Krishna Nushilana, the, the cultivation of Krishna consciousness, going toward Krishna, not making some adjustment here in this material world. Because some adjustment is there. Making a farm community means we're adjusting to this world to some extent. But the idea should be this Smara Nityam and Everything here is temporary. Don't be enamored by this material world. Uh, see the reality. And actually in traditional society we see reality all around us. We see the birth and death we see all the time because in any traditional society there are children being born regularly. Human children. Cow Cows, children. Here in the last week we had two bulls born in the last week. Uh, and all kind of, all different species are being born and dying. And you, in, in the modern world they try, in, in the western world especially, they try to hide death. Old people are take, they're removed from human society. So you can't see them. And the slaughterhouses are outside the city. So you can't hear, you can't hear or you can't see, hear, or smell them. You have to be some distance from the slaughterhouse. Not Otherwise, you, if you see it, if you hear it, or if you smell it, then you'll not want to eat meat. So they keep it a long distance from the city. But uh, the traditional life is much more realistic in that sense. Birth and death are not this... There's no attempt to cover that up in the modern life also. Birth is uh, <coughs> in some hospital or like that. But it's, it's a family. Human birth is in a hospital. So you see when the cow gives birth all the blood and the, it's not very pretty when they first come out. Or, but uh, birth and death we see, we see that all around us. So so, when we speak of natural living, natural means uh, natural food, natural air, natural sounds. In the city you have the sounds of sirens and traffic, and in, in the village at night you have the sound of crickets, and you have the sound of peacocks, and you have the sound of the wind blowing. And It's not that nature is completely silent, but there are different sounds, sometimes quite noisy in the rainy season. 
the frogs make so much noise at night. Sometimes you can't sleep. They make so much noise. Sometimes the uh, peacocks make so much noise also. Sometimes, I didn't see monkeys around here. Sometimes they make a lot of noise also. So uh, natural life means not just uh, what we might say the the nice things, but uh, it's, we could say, raw, <coughs> raw life. We see material life for what it is. In the summer it's hot, no air conditioning. And in the winter it's cold. So, Tang Satikshas for Bharata. We learn to tolerate that. And actually it's not so difficult. In the beginning we may think it's very difficult. But it's not so difficult. I remember once in Bangladesh some devotee from Australia had come. He was just visiting for 10 days or something. And I, just in the morning I went to the tube well, pumped the water and took bath and said, how can you do this? <laughs> All the other, and you, 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 so what's, I mean, the tube well itself is a facility. Otherwise you have to, you have to pull it up by hand or walk one kilometer to the river or something like that. So, but he, he was, he, he was talk, oh, it's so austere. Well, what's, you know, it's just you do it every day and you get used to that also. And it's hot, yeah, it's hot. It's hot. And after some time, the rain break, the rain comes, and then it's cooler. So, modern life is, uh, city life is unnatural in so many ways. And even the people, the, the behavior is very unnatural, very impersonal. And people, uh, <coughs> especially, is very prominent in the West. And we're seeing that more and more in India also. People, uh, their whole personality is, is artificial. It's like they're, they're pretending to be someone they're not. They, they, they mold their, they try, they try to mold their personality based on what they see on the TV or some film star or something like this. I see the boys in India, they, they're, they're playing cricket and they, they kind of lean on the bat and put it like this and you can, I, I don't watch cricket, but I can understand they're copying it from the TV because it's some kind of, you know, some posture. You know what I'm talking about? The, you know, some kind of posture which they learn from seeing some cricketer on the TV. So like that, people are pretending to be something that they're not, and they don't really know who they are. Their whole personality is based on some kind of Rambo they saw on, that's 20 years ago. <laughs> Arnold Schwacken, fucking whatever it is, Schwackenbecker or something like that. He was the actor in Rambo, was it? Do you know? Someone else, I don't know. They're all, you know, some, some uh, oversized gorilla or something. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, they're trying to pretend to be like that. It's just ridiculous. I mean, I don't know how you're going to translate that in Telegram. I mean, I can't even say it in English. <laughs> Some German name. So, uh, but people are, much, you know, people are not pretending to be something else. They don't have any aspiration to, you know, it's, in the modern age, in education, in India, people have the edge oh, I'm going to be a success and go to America and, and <coughs> do this and do that and I'm going to be a space pilot or something. And, in the village, people, you know, you grow up and, you know, your father's making pots or he's a barber and you also become, and there's, there's no big dream of being some great person and you have, you're like that and your father's like that and you're like that and it's just straight, very straightforward. People are very natural in their behavior. It's not, then they don't have any great dream to be something else or yeah, imitating someone else. Just, all right, they live in the village and, you are what, you're just, the personality is as you grow up without trying to be something else. I saw some advertisements in England a couple of years ago. That, uh, I am what I am. I think it's, uh, it's like they're praising people for, for actually being, not pretending to be. What was that advertising? Any idea? Something. Or other. And there was something like some Welsh, footballer or something who is 
he could have, I, I don't know, it's just like, you know, I, they, they, they just, they are what they are, and they're not trying to be something, like that was some great quality or something. Very strange. I tell you, when I go to the West from India, I just think it's a complete madhouse. <laughs> When I come back to India, I think uh, people are at least somewhat more sane here. And the imitation of the West, it's just, what do you want to be like that for? Yeah. And see the Western culture, well, well, they have Batman and Spider-Man. And, uh, what is this? What, what, what a bizarre, insane way of life. I mean, people, in, they have imaginary heroes, like in S Star Trek or not. In India, the heroes are Krishna, Rama, and heroine, Sita, Draupadi. I mean, real people with real values that you can emulate. Real people, the act actual people, the only, the really important people. And in the West, they, in India now also, they adulate film stars who are like the lowest character possible. And they think that these people, oh, they're so great. And in India, Krishna is great, Rama is great, Sita, we should follow them. Anasuya, yesterday some devotee came. His wife's name was Anasuya. <coughs> People, they, I think nowadays the girls growing up, they never even heard of Anasuya. They, <laughs> is it? <laughs> but they're supposed to grow up learning what? What Anasuya taught to Sita. That's essential part of Ramayana. So, uh, natural living, no artificiality, uh, food, clothing, even the rope, you make it yourself. No need of bringing things from outside. So, uh, plain, yeah, simple, good food, good character. High thinking is meaningless unless there's high character. Simply to talk big things and big philosophy and then and the the result is that we we've dreamed up this philosophy and the result is that we're recommending homosex <laughs> this is uh, this is the modern high thinking but high thinking should lead to high character or free sex in the modern the modern western world what it's just like in in traditional indian culture or not only in India, actually all over the world, the central theme was God and religion. <coughs> not only in India, everywhere. I mean, traditional Russian culture is completely, very strongly theistic until communists came. Uh, in, in all of Europe, it was extremely theistic. Uh, there, there were people believed very strongly in God. I mean, it wasn't a matter of belief that should I believe or should I not believe, but it was just a, accepted. And people, there was all these churches have come up in the West. They, they came up because people had a feeling for God. They may not have much knowledge about Him, but it was very strong. But now, if we see in modern society in India and in the West, the main cultural strand is sex, as Prabhupada pointed out. That the whole society, it's, it's increasingly based on, on sex and more and more degraded forms and marriage is not necessary or even if you marry again, you divorce. It's an uh, extremely degraded society. Divorce, homosex, abortion, everything. Abortion's okay, Extremely society. There's, there's no, there's some pretense at vidya, but there's no vairagya. And without vairagya, there cannot be actual vidya. Vairagya means detachment. Vidya means knowledge. Without detachment from this world, there can be no clear knowledge because knowledge, the beginning of knowledge is to understand that this. This material world is temporary. It's not our actual place. So this uh, Bhakti Shastri course is going to be taught now. So take that seriously, of course. Uh, that's why. Why should we take that? It's not like a, 
it's not like a college course. You take a course and then you get you get uh, some degree and then you can use that to further your career. It's not like that. The Bhakti Shastri course is meant for elevation of consciousness. We learn so that we can uh, elevate consciousness. Krishna teaches Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna not so that Arjuna can have a Bhakti Shastri degree, but so that to elevate Arjuna's consciousness from ignorance. But for that elevation, uh, the Vairagya is also required. Without, there's no meaning to having a Bhakti Shastri degree and then uh, just going out and indulging in sense gratification. It's, it's completely meaningless. So, there should be elevation of consciousness, which is uh, manifest in detachment from sense gratification. And Bhakti Shastri means to see through the eye of Shastra. Then there is natural Vairagya. Vasudeva Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojataha. Janyat Yashu Vairagyam Jnanam Chayagahantakam. Bhakti Shastri. Bhakti. Bhakti, uh, concomitant with Bhakti is Jnana and Vairagya. Bhakti means there must be Jnana. There must be Vairagya. Otherwise that Bhakti is not Bhakti at all. So the uh, natural result of <coughs> seeing through the eye of Shastra is that one will become detached from material life, one's material aspirations. I will become a great person in this world. I will become a, a great doctor or a great <coughs> politician or a great scholar or a great this, that or the other. And then one realizes... What is the meaning? What is what is the uh, point of such an aspiration? <clears throat> Rather, one should aspire simply to become a, a humble servant of Krishna and the Vaishnavas. That is real success. The modern idea is promoted. Become a success. Get lots of money. That's not success. Success means... Real success is to develop the consciousness where, whereby one can be completely satisfied without anything external. That's real success. The idea that you, you get more and more, more money, more properties, more, more cars, more titles, more honor. This is the idea of success. But the, the <coughs> spiritual understanding of success is you can be completely satisfied with nothing. <laughs> Vairagya. And the, the modern idea is however much you get, you want more. Just like you see these Ambani brothers. It's, it's how many crores they had between them. But they're fighting, fighting. Now they settled and they're going on doing more business and bribing and this and that. Well, I better not say that. Really, but it seems like that. And so, not satisfied. They could just retire and live a luxurious life. But you know, they're working, more money, like that. Which is not necessarily a bad thing, but then they should use that. If they're expert businessmen, they should use that for the benefit of society rather than just building, building, building their own business empire. So we see that uh, here on this project quite a few devotees are involved who are what would be called materially successful. But they aspire to move to the land. So that's good. That's good. This When one uh, despite having what is called material success, feels that I would be better situated uh, serving the Vaishnavas on the land, depending on the land, the cows and Krishna, then that 
is a step forward, although modern materialistic people would say it's crazy. But then the question is, who is crazy? <laughs> we have a different outlook. I, I, I've often cited this. My one god brother, he was, he told me he has a little farm with a few devotees just outside San Francisco. So devotees were calling him again and again for some, there was what we could call some temple politics, the management and this and that, and devotees were calling him, and, you know, you have to fight for the cause and do, do your duty and get him. And then he told me after some time he thought, now, what is all this? I've, I've got more important things to do. I've got to water the plants, milk the cows. This is much more important than, you know, multi-million dollar property and you know, all this. Who's going to control it? I, I realize, I said, I don't come anymore. I don't get involved in these meetings. I'm doing the really important thing, which is looking after the land, looking after the cows, having kirtan. This is this is the really important thing. No, no, it's a very important meeting. You've got to come. So, no, no, I've got I've got something very important to do. So, yeah, I have to uh, get up in the morning and water the plants. This is actually important. So, I remember that his vision that inspired me. So, uh, there are so many facets to this uh, project and the possibilities. Uh, <coughs> Traditional culture. Uh, this Srila Prabhupada was very much promoting uh, what we would call traditional Indian culture because it is conducive for spiritual life. It's not that, you know, why should I be promoting Indian culture? I'm not born in this country, but because it is conducive for spiritual life. We shouldn't imitate the West. I mean, in India, people are crazy after imitating the West. And even, but we shouldn't uh, imitate that. We should know that the Western culture is, this is not based on Vairagya or Vidya. Therefore, it's based on the opposite of Vairagya is Asati or Anurag or attachment to material life. And Avidya, ignorance. Yeah. Cell phones off, please. You have to say it three, four times during every class. We'll, we'll have on the gate the entrance that no, no cars coming inside and no cell phones. <laughs> in temples, that's standard. In many temples in India now, you can't go in the temple with the cell phone. So that would be a good thing to institute. Yeah. <clears throat> so don't imitate this uh, Western culture. No. There was a time when in our movement the devotees, they had the right idea, the devotees in the West, to follow the Indian culture. But nowadays they got the wrong idea. And uh, many of them. And they think that Western culture is better because in the West there's a lot of propaganda against Indian culture, and there's this there's this idea that we are actually civilized. You see. If there's some riot in the West, they promote it as something you know just some aberration or something unusual because we're actually civilized people. And if there's a riot in Africa or India, they promote it like well, see that's just normal for them. They promote this idea that actually we Western people, we're very civilized and everyone else is very uncivilized. And unfortunately, the, the people of the world believe this and they're all imitating the West. But it's just propaganda. It's only propaganda. I mean, the history of the Western world is one of uh, violence, exploitation, extortion, uh, and uh, fanatical religion. And in the modern age, degradation. I'm not saying that everything in the West is bad and everything in India is good. But actually the best of everything is in the original Vedic culture. And we want to show that. We want to show that. 
So when we say Vedic culture, uh, it doesn't just mean dressing in dhotis and saris, although that's there, that's part of it. But that, that point that I, I made, that the, the very ethos is a highly spiritual one, that people understand we're living, we're living in this world for the sake of getting out of it. We're living in this world for the sake of serving Krishna. So that culture, although it sounds very extreme, we're getting out of this world, but it actually has all the, uh, all enjoyment. Krishna's culture is, uh, all enjoyment. It's, uh, bhakti is based on music, song, dance, drama, and then, uh, hearing and discussing about Krishna and Rama and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu culture, very high scholarship. So that is there, but it's not degraded. There's all, there are also certain rules and standards of behavior to be followed, uh, especially the, uh, as different to the modern Western culture, there are very uh, strict rules for male-female relationships. I mean, even until very recently in India, you couldn't just walk up to someone, a man just can't walk up to a woman and start talking to her. It's, uh, it's just not done. It may be still to some extent, but that's changing now. Uh, there's clear distinction of varna and ashram. Uh, yeah, Prabhupada also spoke of varna ashram, which means there will be varnas, uh, but varna ashram without casteism. If we can understand that, that certain people they will will take the role of brahmanas, and some people will take the role of shudras or vaishas or kshatriyas or whatever. It's difficult to see exactly the role of kshatriyas. But uh, the the main designation of everyone is that we're vaishnavas, and we're all just serving Krishna in different ways. Not no division of an, an ashram. But not uh, with exploitation or one group thinking that they're better than another group. That's actual spiritual culture. So, uh, yeah, the whole culture, we want, as far as possible, we want to revive that in all its details. That uh, uh, In traditional culture, you see, even the cows are decorated. What to speak of the human beings that uh, both in traditional culture both men and women are decorated they have earrings and different ornaments and, uh, maybe not every day but uh, certainly on festivals and there are many festivals uh, very nicely dressed even now in some places like in Dwaraka and Gokarna you can see the pujaris they'll dress in different colors do dhotis and Someday purple, someday green, yeah, yeah, and like yeah, that. So, a, a very uh, vibrant, colorful culture. And, uh, yeah, not just decoration, with, but but the, the kajal for for young children. It's actually very good for the eyes, also. This uh, nowadays, you see in India, the, the women like to put this nail polish and all that, but the traditional is this uh, kajal for the eyes, and very, it's very cool and cooling, and it's, uh, it's not, I don't know what all these lipsticks and all that's made from some animal fats or something, but kajal is very, so you just make it, anyway. you know what kajal is? What is, it's you just burn a candle and beeswax candle and you collect the soot and that's kajal. That's what it is. It's it's uh, very simple and cheap and, and very uh, medicinal also. And then uh, just on Ram Nomi I happened to notice one of the ladies had the turmeric and it was 20 years ago here they were on, on, smeared on the body that was normal for all women. Now it's become very rare isn't it? But that that's uh, also natural decoration and also very uh, very medicinal. And the, for the, the women also alta on the feet. I don't know what the Telugu word is. In, in, in all the 
Vaishnav books, they say red lac dye. That's how it's translated. They always describe Radha as having red lac dye on her feet. So that that's uh, traditional. Radha, all the gopis they have this red on the feet. So all these kind of things. Uh, these are just some ideas or suggestions. How people lived uh, <coughs> happily, peacefully. Uh, many children, many cows, lots of kirtan, many festivals. So uh, joyful life. Whereas this, uh, you see, if you if you make things like you make you cook your own food. You make even your own ropes. You do everything yourself. Then there's a self, there's a sense of self-fulfillment. Whereas if you just buy everything, it's it's just like you're dependent on everyone for everything. Whereas even if the rope you make yourself, that gives a sense of satisfaction. It, it's not that you just go out and you buy some plastic chairs, but someone makes that, and everything is done with love. Again, in traditional society, people would make a chair. They wouldn't just make some, put, slap some pieces of wood together, but they'd put some nice carving. The carving serves no functional purpose. It doesn't make the chair better in any other way except that the person who made it, uh, he wants to make something that looks nice because it's going to be there in the room for, you know, years if it's well made. So let it let there be something which looks nice, and then everyone. It's just a small thing, but it makes everyone feel more happy. And instead of just having functional things, that means you make a chair with the absolute minimum work required to make it. No, do do something a little nicer. Make a little carving, a little design. Make something nice. So in this way, people feel fulfilled. Whereas in modern society. And then you see everyone's work, the carpenter, the barber, the farmer, the teacher, the doctor, everyone works together integrally. In the modern life, there's the idea that, that, that you have to earn a livelihood. But there's no earning livelihood in traditional culture. It's not that you work and you get so much money. But you just work and you don't get any money. Because there is no money. That's all. You, you, it's... You, in Vedic culture, you just do your dharma, that's all. The barber shaves people's head, the potter makes pots, and shaves heads, and cuts the barber cuts the nails, he goes to weddings, he has some functions. So everyone is, they have their dharma to perform, and the dharma of the Vaishyas is to produce food, and the dharma of the Kshatriyas is to take and distribute that food. So like that, is, there's there's no money, just you, everyone has their duty to perform. There's no question of earning a living. Your livelihood is already taken care of. You just have to contribute your part to society. So it's a completely different way of looking at, of, of living in the world. and uh, There's no insecurity or anxiety. Everything is already there. But you have to perform that time. You have to make your contribution. And ultimately that's offered to Krishna. Sve sve karmanya pirata sam siddhim nabhate naraha. Svakarmana tanabhya ja siddhim vinditi maranava. Twice in Bhagavad Gita, in two different ways. Krishna says that by performing one's dharma, which is not to take photographs in the middle of the class, please. Uh, and worshipping Krishna by performing one's work, one can achieve all perfection. So it's all integrated. That you, you do, you, everyone's living together, working together, with the aim that everything should be done for the pleasure of Krishna. And Krishna becomes pleased, and everyone achieves the perfection of life. So, <coughs> it's... We hear a lot of propaganda that, oh, it's very difficult to live on the land and people can't get adjusted to it. But I think it's just, to a large extent, I think it's a matter of preaching. Because if we preach that, well, it's very difficult to live on the land and it's very austere, then people will think like that. And uh, But if we say, actually, it's very nice. And actually, it is very nice. As 
one devotee who's been, he has two MAs. Uh, he's been living on the land in Belgium, that farm there for maybe almost 10 years now. And he told me that physically it's austere. You know, they, they have to carry water from the river like that. And so in some ways it's physically austere, but mentally it's so much better. We feel so much happier. So it requires some preaching. Instead of preaching, no, no, the farm's very bad and it's very difficult and this and that. You preach, oh, it's, yeah, there's some difficulties. Sure, there are difficulties in city life too. But overall, it's much better. And actually it is. Once you get used to it, you won't want to live in any other way. Why, why should you want to go to the crowded, smelly, dirty, exploitive city? If you can live in a community of devotees uh, happily serving Krishna and the cows, serving the whole human society. So it requires some preaching. Yeah, that means uh, preaching Krishna course is Bhakti Shastri course. This should be focused on how we can uh, practically apply this in our life. It's not like some philosophy, it's in a book. But it's Bhakti Shastri, those who are taking out the cows and milking the cows, that is their Bhakti Shastri. <laughs> Actually, that's practical. Following the example of Krishna. So, uh, I, I, of course, it's not just for when we talk about preaching, a movement is a preaching movement, it's not just for us that we're building this making this project and we're all going to live happily here, but it's meant to show an example to others also. So we should have the aim of first establishing a community here, which requires self-sacrifice. We have to, to live in a community, you have to give up your egoism. We have, we have the small family, in which it's just hamdo hamare do, just me and I don't care about my mother and father, it's just me and my own children. It's very bad propaganda. Hamdo Hamarido. Because family means... Actually, we find in Chaitanya Charitamrita that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, I will get married and look after my parents. That's the first consideration. Not that I will get a wife to enjoy with. But I will marry and look after my parents. That's the first consideration. And the wife assists in that. But nowadays, girls will say, well, I marry the one condition, we don't live with your parents. Or you come and live with my parents. So uh, this, I, and then in in uh, I told you that several times in Finland they have these huge apartment buildings with tiny apartments for one person, because most people in the, in Helsinki they live alone. They don't have any family. It's sex you can get anywhere, food you can get anywhere. What do you need a family? <laughs> so they just live alone and completely miserable. So, uh, but they have the egoism of thinking, I'm just on my own. You can indulge in, you can indulge in egoism, not as much as you like, but to a large extent. But living in a community means that cooperation and not, not just living for myself, but living as a, a unit in a community. I have to, serve and cooperate with others. So that uh, living for others, that is Krishna, that is the higher level of Krishna consciousness, para upaka. So we should think also that this area around how we can make all the people Krishna conscious, Prabhupada described how from the farm Devotees can go out on bullock carts and preach in the surrounding villages and hold festivals and people from the surrounding villages can come and join in kirtan and take prasada and like that. So there's uh, much to be done. Big vision. But take it step by step also. Don't bring the city mentality to the village. Just be, uh, to be content to be here.
chanting Hare Krishna and living on the land, that in itself is quite an achievement for people raised in city life. <laughs> but it's a great step forward. And the world is going to have to come to this anyway, because this artificial society based on oil and electricity and nuclear power, and anyway it's breaking down. And it is. People can see that already, it's breaking down. This, uh, I just saw the newspaper headline this morning, India is pressing ahead with nuclear power projects despite the, war the warning for the whole world and is there in Japan, this, this nuclear disaster. But still, they're blind and they're pushing on. It's, it's, it's the nuclear disaster with the uh, earthquake and tsunami. India also, there are so many earthquakes, so they can have exactly the same problem. But they're so blind, they're just pushing on with it. So, uh, we're studying Shastra, but we're studying Bhakti Shastra means especially through Prabhupada's teachings. So Prabhupada's teachings are quite revolutionary in terms of how modern people think, but we should take that fully. That is our path of welfare. If we try to compromise with the modern way of thinking, it's a disaster. Prabhupada had the vision to, he was Shastra Chakshu in the full sense. He had the vision to see how this whole world is deluded. He, he didn't go to the West and say, oh, everything is so wonderful here. No. He had the vision to see what is um, actually required for human society. And although he made some adjustments to Western society for preaching, we shouldn't think that the adjustments that Srila Prabhupada made should be the standard, but rather the traditional Vedic culture, or, uh, that is the standard. Not that because Prabhupada allowed this and he allowed that, then that should be the standard for the whole world for future. Because it doesn't work. The, the, it doesn't, the Western culture is not conducive for advancement in Krishna consciousness. So, uh, let's try to follow the original culture here as far as possible. And that the higher culture means, uh, of course, speaking in Sanskritam. That's, that's something that can be introduced gradually also. I'm sitting here speaking in English, which is a, actually a, a useful language, but in the sense that people in the world speak it. But, but it's, it's uh, Malecha Bhasha. It's not the very nature of the language, it doesn't elevate the consciousness. Whereas the very, the, the very nature of Sanskritam is that uh, <coughs> the, the, the tendency is there in the very language to, to elevate the consciousness, the, the very uh, structure and usages and, the, and of course the whole culture that goes with that. Sanskritam, Sanskriti. The word Sanskriti is translated in English as culture, although it's not exactly the same thing. Anyway, Hare Krishna, that's all I'm going to say about that for now, unless there are any questions about this, or comments, or whatever. Yes? The vision that Srila Prabhupada had for the Hyderabad farm well, it wasn't that much different to that that he had for any other farm. Uh, the idea was, yeah. Actually, if you want to get this in detail, you have to ask Tejas Prabhu. But the, the idea was that, that uh, call the local villages every night, have kirtan and prasadam for everyone. And he said to start Gurukul immediately. Then when the one devotee said, they asked Prabhupada after a few days, he said, so where's the Gurukul? He said, well, first we have to collect and build a building. Prabhupada said, you don't need a building. You can just start teaching under the tree. Knowledge is not dependent on buildings. So that's one point from Hyderabad. Cleanliness, Prabhupada was much insistent on cleanliness in the Hyderabad farm. Also, when a devotee asked about digging wells, Prabhupada said, chant Hare Krishna, rain will come, no need to dig wells. 
So I'm told. Even though this, this uh, water is available there without dealing, without going deeply. So there's a few points. Okay, I will move on. Anything else on that? If you want to know more deeply, you can ask Tejas Prabhu.